very much, John and Minister. Thank you. Um, we are going to shift now to our first panel. John, actually, if you can come back up. Bill uh, and your fellow panelists, please come on up and take the stage. As we're doing this, let me just mention that there will be microphones set up uh, at, for the end of each panel for people in the audience to ask questions. We do ask you to ask questions, not make a long statement. Um, and we'll have our panelists take their roles here. And more than my mic. Bill, I'll give you the mic. I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay, yeah, you bet. You want to? No, please. Yeah, yeah. You can speak. Yeah. No, I'm yes, yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. David, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it is an honor uh, and a pleasure to be here, and and, uh, and an honor to be here with this distinguished panel. Um, uh, David wanted to be sure this was conversational. So we will try to make it such, uh, which means that we will look forward to your conversation, your questions, your comments um, on this topic. The topic that we're talking about here this morning, um, and Miroslav is going to lead us off, even though she, she objects to being called on first. <laughs> we, of course we want to have Ukrainian voice lead this off. The question for us this morning is what should be the Western response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, we have a, a very well-qualified panel to talk about this. Oh, we even have, oh, we have, I get this. this. Uh, they get the uh, earphones. You want to trade? No, this is good. <laughs> Thanks, John. We could talk a lot about the existing response. We could talk about what the international community, the West, um, has done in support of Ukraine. But we only have an hour. David Kramer is going to be sure that we don't go over this hour. So, in order to get the most out of it, we're going to talk about what we should do now. What we should do, go, what the West should do going forward to support Ukraine. We've talked already um, about why this is so important. Ukraine has to win. Ukraine has to be victorious. Russia has to lose. Ukraine has to take back its territory. Ukraine has to continue its progress towards the European Union. Um, at some point, NATO. In order for Ukraine to win, the West has to continue to step up and even step up more. It's very clear that we've not done enough. We need to do more. And this is what the what topic is today. The areas are, are broad. We've talked a lot about the military assistance, and more needs to come. Um, we've talked about sanctions that have been imposed on the Russians, and export bans uh, that have been imposed on the Russians. Having an effect, more needs to come. John Herbst has already talked about uh, the importance of the central bank reserves. We'll probably talk about that some more. Financial support. Ukrainian government needs $5 billion a month, or $9 billion a month, somewhere in that range, to pay the soldiers who are fighting, um, to pay the railway workers um, who, are, who are doing heroic work, all the rest of the government, $5 billion a month. That's not coming yet. That needs to come, so we'll talk about that. Energy is going to be a big problem. And we've got Ed Chow, um, who knows something about energy and has done, has done for some time. Um, so that's going to be a big piece. And then, as I say, reconstruction. Reconstruction needs to start now, can't wait. Um, but then there's an enormous job of reconstruction. The minister has just described $105 billion. That's a way low estimate for the overall. We're talking about $750 billion, a trillion dollars. That reconstruction effort needs to be well organized. Hugh Mingarelli, Ambassador Mingarelli, has some ideas about this. So, Ambassador, I want to be sure you get part of this conversation here uh, today on what we need to do going forward. And with that, let me introduce the panel, and we will get to these, these conversations. As I, as I have threatened uh, Miroslava, she's going to go first. Miroslava Gongazi, um, from the Voice of America, uh, will, will lead us off. Thank you, Miroslava. Hang on, I'm going to ask this question. Uh, Viola 
von Kremen Travabel is a very distinguished member of European Parliament, Parliament um, represented other districts in Germany and member of, distinguished member of the Green Party um, in Germany. Uh, we'll follow up. And uh, we have uh, Nicholas Denzer, uh, an, a, another European view. Um, Ed Chow uh, from CSIS in Washington, as I mentioned, knows something about energy. And John Herbst, you've already, uh, David Kramer has already introduced John as former ambassador uh, to Ukraine. So, Miroslava, the question is, what should the West do? What's the response? What, how can we support Ukraine in its fight and, and, its, and its steps toward victory um, uh, now and going forward? Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel. Uh, I'm filling in, <laughs> by the way, but I'm happy to, uh, to be here. Uh, as a news reporter, as a journalist, I would like to um, uh, start with the latest uh, news. Uh, Peskov uh, just said the Russian government is ready for negotiation. Uh, they hinted that they are ready for negotiation. That means that Ukrainian army is really gaining some grounds uh, defending Ukraine. Uh, so let's start with what we have to do at this point. There is no way Ukraine uh, will enter this negotiation. Ukraine shouldn't enter this negotiation because that means Russia is trying to uh, uh, get some air try to reorganize themselves and they would definitely go further and go attack Ukraine again. Because for Russia and for Putin, Ukraine is existential threats. It's existential threats for his power, it's existential threats for Russia itself. Let me remind you what happened uh, back half a year ago when um, Different estimates gave Ukraine three to five days, specifically that Kyiv would withstand these Russian, uh, Russian forces. We are here half a year later. Ukraine is still standing. Ukraine is standing strong. Ukraine is uh, deoccupying, deoccupying territories that already was, were taken. And Ukrainian economy even in this environment, is growing. 2%. That means that we have a lot of hope for Ukraine today. And that means that we have to be more forceful in supporting Ukraine. Bill just uh, noticed uh, and said about this important support. And um, right now, I think the West is doing halfway. Unfortunately, with all the help that Ukraine already received and U.S. leadership um, uh, organizing this, um, this um, coalition, uh, Western coalition to support Ukraine, uh, unfortunately, uh, the deeds are not yet uh, followed fully. Uh, we hear a lot of um, statements, promises, a lot of money have been promised, but unfortunately, after talking to many foreign ministers, at least I talked for, to six or seven of them in just in the last two weeks, I have to say that majority of that money is still uh, in the budgets of uh, Western European countries. This has to be changed. Uh, the United States, the support for military support for Ukraine is halfway again because Ukraine is receiving only uh, some of the uh, ammunition and, uh, and military support that they are asking for. And with the, um, uh, with the, for, with the ammunition that Ukraine is receiving right now, it cannot uh, liberate its territory. Uh, the, the support has to be sustainable, military and, and, and financial. It has to be planned in advance. It has to be um, you know, persistent and permanent until Ukraine will 
um, will uh, uh, liberate its territories. Uh, there is a couple of assumptions uh, uh, why the United States is not ready to give fully. And one of assumptions is that um, we still want to talk to Russia and maintain some kind of negotiation and talks. And second assumption is that we will provoke Putin uh, because of the possible use of nuclear weapons. It's very important to understand that if we are doing something halfway, we are just prolonging uh, suffering of Ukrainians and we are uh, risking uh, the West to lose in this war. And nobody can afford it. Uh, the Eastern, uh, Eastern European flank of countries are very, very, uh, st stand strong for Ukraine. They understand. The Baltic states, the Poland, the Czech Republic, the Slovenia, Slovakia, Eastern European fl flanks understand. And they are doing the utmost what they can. Unfortunately, Western European flanks are not yet uh, doing enough uh, in, 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 this, in this effort. But going back to the, to the assumption, um, we already in the third world, world war three, like people of uh, world war three, uh, people think that uh, if the, you don't see the suffering, if you are not um, physically the bombing, the, the not feeling the bombing, you're not, you, the, the war is too far. No, the war is here already today. Because if Ukraine will fail, uh, the Western democratic community would lose uh, its stance and possibly we, have, we are basically threatened, it's threatened our life and our uh, way of being. Too long, too long. Okay, sorry, sorry. Okay. So, um, Okay, then I will conclude and then go, 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 go um, uh, further later. Um, so support then, if, okay, uh, military support, the Ukraine has to, has to win today, uh, ideally before the winter uh, comes. Second, uh, the, if Ukraine, when Ukraine will win, uh, we have to have uh, already emergency fund to, to help Ukrainian business right away today. We have to have a strategy before winter, how, Ukraine, how, to, how to rebuild Ukraine and what to do uh, later with uh, Russian policy and Ukrainian policy. I will, st I will stop here and then we'll go again. Thanks. Ms. Lava, thank you. Exactly what we need uh, from the Ukrainian voice uh, on what we need to do. We're halfway, you say. We need to be more. We need to be more. That's the message that's come out of this. And you had some specific points. Very, very useful. Viola, over to you. Okay. The question, of course, is, based on this, what should Europe do in response to the Russian invasion? Thank you so, <clears throat> so much. Well, I mean, Europe does a lot, but as uh, Miroslav said, not enough. And we have to step up much more. I have not heard about the Peskov comment that they are ready for negotiation, but that can mean a lot. I mean, we had heard that many times before, but normally it means the full capitulation of Ukraine only uh, to the Russian terms or according to the Russian terms and there was no will or desire to really negotiate. But the Western states, and I mean France and Germany, are very likely to trap into this or to fall into this Russian trap because they have a huge desire. I mean, each and every week in our German media, there pops up a letter of, come on, let's make peace, let's go back, let's find a, a peaceful negotiation solution and whatsoever. So if they hear this Peskov first uh, indication, they are ready for negotiation, we have to strengthen and support Ukraine even more with weapons, 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 heavy weapons, tanks, whatsoever, whatever we can find, not just in terms of announcement, what we heard very often by the chancellor, but in terms of deeds and real, um, I mean, deliveries. And that is definitely lacking, and that is our problem also in terms of credibility. I mean, the Americans do a lot, they could do more, I've heard that from my Ukrainian partners, but nevertheless, <clears throat> nevertheless, they do a lot, and also the Brits. 
but when we look, and as Miroslava said, of course, all our Eastern European member states, they are fully aware of what is on stake and they help as much as they can. Germany, in that respect, I would say they do a lot in terms of money and in terms of humanitarian aid and uh, reforms and everything else, but in, when it comes to the real hardware, we are still lacking the awareness of what is necessary, and I feel personally extremely ashamed of <clears throat> how far we are behind of, of what uh, our potential is. So, on one hand, hardware. Second one is strategic communication. I mean, when Peskov is, 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 is saying this, or other um, uh, Russian disinfo campaign, that is flying normally extremely well, and we have not found a way how to counter this. We are very weak in this strategi strategic communication, not just in Europe, but all over the world. We have had this uh, uh, example of grain. I mean, all over the Middle East, North Africa, uh, Sub-Sahara Africa, it was very ho often heard that it's the Western sanctions who let the people suffer, which is not true. But there was no active, proactive communication <clears throat> from our side explaining to the poor, most vulnerable people there what is the truth and why it happened as it happened. And I think this is, a <clears throat> we are losing countries, we are losing the states who were more or less um, ambivalent at the, uh, at the beginning, but maybe changed even side uh, towards the, the Russian and had kind of a sympathy for this Russian um, narratives. Then coming from Germany, I mean everything I have read of how far Gazprom and the Russian uh, corruptive, um, coercive uh, structures went into politics, business communities, society, even school books. I mean, we really need an investigative <coughs> committee in the German Bundestag to work on that, to find out who is in charge, <coughs> who is responsible, and <coughs> sorry about that, and what to do to prevent this uh, from happening again. And also to work on our, um, on our um, history, our past, our responsibility. I see that in the European community, at least uh, with uh, the president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, we have a real political will to step up more. But uh, what it is lacking, it's still, uh, I would say, the council. Uh, it's not the European Parliament, my esteemed uh, colleague Anna Fatiga and many other friends uh, from uh, the European Parliament are, uh, I mean, there to support Ukraine in a much more massive way. And there is, I would say, a political will in most of the European uh, countries, but when it comes to the stronger countries, especially in the West, um, I could imagine uh, we need to push more and we could also expect a little bit uh, more, let's say, transparent push from the US and from other um, NATO partners. Viola, uh, thank you. So to my American colleagues, uh, listen carefully. Uh, we've just been encouraged, the United States has been encouraged to push harder on Europeans and, and others. Um, we don't do this particularly well. We're not particularly subtle about this, but, uh, but with that encouragement, we can, we can, move, this, we can move this forward. Um, Nicola, uh, uh, you've been introduced. Uh, please, from here, what, what can Europe do um, in response to this invasion? Well, uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, well, I, I will speak from a French perspective because I am a French person, and in fact, I won't disagree at all with what uh, Miroslava and Viola already said. Basically, my first statement would be that we are not serious in our support to Ukraine. The West is not serious in its support to Ukraine. We are talking about your solidarity with Ukraine, we stand with Ukraine, but we let hundreds of thousands of people killed by the Russian forces. We did nothing to prevent Mariupol. We did nothing to prevent Bucha. We did nothing to prevent Epin. And still, no, we are not really protecting the Ukrainian lives and enforcing seriously the R2P responsibility to protect. And I think we have to understand this statement, not only, I mean, 
regarding you know, Europe, but also the US, basically. When it comes to weapons, sorry to repeat what you already said, but I fully agree with you. We are not providing enough weapons. We are not providing tanks. We are not providing aircraft. We are not providing long-range missiles to Ukraine. There should be no restraint, no restrictions, no limitation of any kind. And for me, if we want to help Ukraine, we have to be very strict on this. The time is of the essence. Each day that passes means thousands of hundreds of thousands of lives taken by Ukrainian troops. So it's not a question of years, not a question of months, but it should be in the mind of our Western leaders a question of days and weeks. And I think what we want to ensure here is that there is a complete misperception of Russia. And I will also say the second thing. Of course, we have to help Ukraine, as I said. But we have to make Russia lose this war. Not only lose this war, but lose radically, totally. And the questions of rigid change must not be a taboo also for the sakes of Russian people, the Russian freedom fighters. And I think we must be very clear. President Biden said that he was expecting that uh, Putin will fall. He was right. Then maybe he regrets, and the White House communicate, tried to just to stop what President Biden actually said. But he was completely right. And the third thing I want to emphasize very shortly is that we have to speak much more about the war crimes, the crimes against humanity, the crime of genocide, and the crime of aggressions perpetrated by Putin's regime, and that the question of justice is absolutely not secondary. If we consider the immensity of crimes committed by Russia and Ukraine, the question of justice must become our first concern. Yes, Mr. Putin has to go to The Hague, or there's a place or a kind of rumble trial of any kind, and so Lavrov, and so the others. It's not a question of options. And I think that uh, still we have some uh, Western leaders saying, well, we have to engage with Russia, or we have to return to business as usual with Russia, etc., of these kind of things. And they're ready to shake again the hand of Mr. Putin. Would have their leaders, these leaders, shaken the hand of uh, Osama bin Laden or Abu Bakr al Haftari? The main difference between those persons, bin Laden, Baghdadi, and Mr. Putin, is that actually Putin has killed many more people than the leaders of Al Qaeda and ISIS did. And my last point is that uh, we have to prepare Ukrainian future. Because I was, when I was in Ukraine last time, was in April, I had a discussion with a lot of uh, Ukrainian leaders, the mayors of many cities, uh, Kiev, Lviv, etc. They were never complaining. Of course, they were asking for more weapons, but they were not complaining. They were all the time speaking about only one thing, which is the future of Ukraine. So I think that the EU integration of Ukraine actually is not a gift to Ukraine. It's an asset for Europe. It's an asset for the world. And I am completely certain that what Russia, uh, Ukraine will offer to the EU, will offer to the world in terms of experience, resilience, strength, dignity, spirituality in a way, will be a true asset. And I am certain that Ukraine will be a country and so basically, I think we have to completely reverse our stance and to see concretely that Ukraine is probably the, leader, the leading country of Europe to come. Thank you very much. <coughs> Nicola, well said, well said. <coughs>
We will come back to those. I'm very glad you raised those points on justice, um, on the value of Ukraine to Europe and to the United States and to the West and to the world. And thank you. Thank you very much. Ed Chow, yes, sir. winter is coming. What should we do to prepare going forward, Ed? Uh, Bill, as you said, uh, I know a little bit of something about energy and not much of anything else. So I'm going to try to st stick to my knitting uh, as much as possible. I think the first thing we have to do is to recognize the magnitude of the geopolitical shock to global energy markets that has occurred. I, I, I would be bold to say that it's probably the greatest geopolitical shock since, the, since World War II. Even for those of us who remember the twin, two twin oil shocks in the 1970s, I think we will look back and say that this is a bigger impact. Uh, for, for those of you who won't remember the 1970s, um, the Arab oil embargo lasted for five months. This war has gone on for six months with no end in sight. So this is very, very serious, and, and we should re recognize the magnitude. As the Belgian government, both the prime minister and energy minister said recently, this is not a problem of one year, but five to 10 and, and maybe longer. The second point I would make is that economic sanctions take a long time to work, if at all. And oil sanctions are notoriously leaky. Uh, if we didn't know that before, we should have known that with Saddam Hussein's Iraq and Muammar Gaddafi's um, uh, Libya. It was ultimately military intervention that took care of the situation uh, in both places, not sanctions. And in this case, Ukraine is not asking the West to fight for it. It's asking for armaments so that the West, that so that the West would arm Ukraine for fight for themselves, but also for Western security and, and Western values at the same time. There is no silver bullet in a oil ban of uh, or a price cap. I would submit to you if the objective is to end this war as quickly as, as possible. Um, it, it is necessary, economic sanctions are necessary to degrade uh, Putin's ability to wage this war in the medium to long term. But let's face it, he's waging this war with the energy revenue for the, from the last 20 years, not with the energy revenue of, of this year. And, and, and this is very important to remember. And that brings me to my last point, which is that we need to explain to our own population the magnitude of, of, of the situation and our own interests, Western interests, that are at, at stake. At least speaking for the United States, I don't think that's well been well explained. We're, we're telling Americans that we're here to help Ukraine, but not for our own interests as well. And, and I think that will concerns me at that as winter comes, alliance um, cohesion uh, will be tested. Um, and the, we have the very unfortunate incident a couple of weeks ago with the American Energy Secretary writing to refining companies in the United States saying, please don't export as much petroleum products as you're currently doing. Maybe you should be building domestic stock and um, if you don't do something about this, maybe the government would, will have to consider measures to force you to do this. This is very dangerous talk because Western solidarity in energy security is extremely important. We're going to have the same issue with US LNG. US natural gas prices are now three times what they were a year ago this time. European natural gas prices are 10 times higher than U.S. natural gas prices. So we should be supporting Europe by 
continuing our commitment to free trade in, in energy. But if we send signals of not doing that, then alliance unity would fray. And in order to do this politically, we need to explain to our own people what's at, at, at stake. Europe is going to have a similar political issue uh, when it comes to sharing gas storage this winter. That's going to be a tough nut to crack. Uh, but, but the United States have a role to play, and we should step up more and, and think long term and not just think about gasoline prices for this summer or, or, or this fall. Ed, thank you. Um, we will have an opportunity to, to explore some of these, and I'd be interested both in Viola and, and Nicholas' uh, uh, thoughts on, on maintaining that unity. And the energy is an important part. Um, unity among the alliance um, more broadly on all these issues is going to be key. Unity in Ukraine is going to be key. Um, this is going. This will. This will be. This will be. This will be determinative. If we can maintain that support, populations as well as the as the governments, this will be. This will be real important. John Herbst, what should we do going forward? What you? I know you've given some thought to this. Uh, please, <laughs> over to you. Okay. Um, this is this panel has been a little bit incestuous as we've all been touching on similar themes. And I'm going to try and sort of sum up what they've said, but offer also my, put in my framework of my own. Uh, one way to look at this is that the United States must act today as it has in much of its recent past, recent meaning since the end of World War II, as a superpower with the will, the determination, and the vision to defend its interests wherever those interests are threatened. And this starts with a point that um, Ed just made that we must recognize and lay out for the American public, and for that matter, for our allies as well, that Putin's revisionist foreign policy is an existential threat to our way of life. And therefore, we're not just helping Ukraine, we are defeating a threat that's coming for us. If we explain it that way, the American people should have no questions about why we're expending significant resources in Ukraine. That's point one. Two, we must act in accordance with what I've just said, meaning robustly to defeat Putin in Ukraine. That means we should be doing what we should have been doing since not February 24, but roughly November or December of last year, which is sending Ukraine all the weapons that it needs, in the first case, had we done it before February, to deter a major new invasion from the Kremlin, but now to defeat it. So no more quibbling when Ukraine asks for advanced aircraft, when Ukraine asks for tanks, when Ukraine asks for armored personnel carriers, when Ukraine asks for, quote unquote, because I'm not a military guy, long range fires, meaning artillery which can shoot not just the artificially imposed limit we have placed of 85 kilometers, but 150 or 300 kilometers. Give Ukraine the ability to strike in as deadly a fashion as possible with the least of vulnerability. And doing these things will assure that. Doing these things will make certain that the offensive Ukraine is currently conducting in the South actually succeeds. At the rate that we are dribbling out support to Ukraine, that offensive may proceed and have some gains, but a breakdown of Russian defense, successful offensive, is probably not in the cards until we provide more. Uh, Nick talked about something important, which will help galvanize the international community, including in the United States, but also help demoralize Moscow, which is focusing intensely on the Kremlin war crimes, which border on genocide. This should be talking point number one whenever we confront skeptics, whether it's in the United States or in Germany or in France, about the reason for this war. It's Putin's war, a war of extermination against Ukrainians and Ukrainian nests. And we need to remind the defenders of the Kremlin, albeit the indirect defenders, what they are defending. Also, in the category of acting like a superpower, we need to be tough with our adversaries. With our allies, we need to consult, which the Biden team does very well. But being a leader means sometimes you have to tell the allies what they've got to do. No more of this Nord Stream 2 nonsense where we let the Germans proceed with something which is manifestly against their and our interests. 
by the way, it's a delight to hear from German mouth the need for more weapons to Ukraine. Okay, in this category of talking firmly with our pals, the United States, the Biden administration deserves great credit for the amount of assistance it has given. The quality, we have some quibbles about, important quibbles. But the EU, which in theory is an economic superpower, in theory and in fact, not being, don't want to be nasty here, has failed miserably to meet its commitments to provide a comparable amount of economic assistance. Now, a vast is lost right here. This has to be fixed. Uh, we've heard from senior administra U.S. administration officials this will be fixed this month. I hope that's true. If not, we should be in their ears all about this because this is completely unacceptable. Okay. Uh, oh, last point, last point. Anyone who's dealt with Moscow for 40 plus years, as I have, knows that one of the favorite Russian tactics is the equivalent of Muhammad Ali's rope-a-dope. Now, rope-a-dope was Muhammad Ali let his opponent punch himself out before he could take out his opponent. What the Russians do is call diplomatic rope-a-dope. They get you to negotiate with yourself. They offer almost nothing except a hint here or there, and then you excitedly bring out all these ideas. And Mr. Piskoff apparently has put this on the table again. Uh, we've heard from our fellow panelists about how there's all this anxiety, especially in Europe, to get negotiations started. We also hear of this from some quarters, not particularly far-seeing quarters in the United States. No. Negotiations will be essential to end this war, but this will only happen, real negotiations, not rope-a-dope negotiations, when we know that the Kremlin understands they cannot establish full control over Ukraine. And that point has not been reached yet. You want to reach that point? Send all the weapons to Ukraine, take out the Kremlin in Kherson in the south, and force Putin to a real negotiation. Thank you. John, well said, well said. <clears throat> so well said that uh, I imagine, before we go to audience questions, um, I, I imagine there would be some thoughts on some of the things that we've all said. And Viola is first on this list. Uh, I, I, I would love to, yes, thanks. Uh, because we were also speaking about the, uh, so to say, potential and how to keep up the unity within the European Union amongst the member states, and this would be a challenge. I mean, this is not a secret. Uh, Hungary is a spoiler and is more or less the anchor of the Kremlin in, in the European Union, but now Bulgaria was taken over by Russia as well. Unfortunately, the government was toppled due to the negotiation with uh, North Macedonia, and I've heard that the Russian ambassador in Bulgaria acts like a governor. So, I mean, that is a very bad signal. And I'm afraid we have spoken about our population and how to convince our population. It will be very hard uh, for the next winter for most of our member states, especially those like Germany, or such as Germany, uh, which are extremely um, dependent on, on Russian gas. And I see already the first, let's say, rallies with Russian flags, not just in Eastern uh, Germany, but also in the Western bigger cities. They are flanked by the left, they are flanked by pro-Russian activists. I see the FSB playbook. It is so easy for the Kremlin to abuse this for a bigger social uprise, and I'm not so sure how our government, which are in general very much supportive for Ukraine, especially the Green members, um, how are we going to survive this politically? We are willing to, but I tell you, it will be very rough, very tough. And uh, after I've talking to ordinary citizens who now, from 100 euro, have to pay like seven, 800, sometimes 1,000 euro per month only on gas and electricity, this is sometimes hard to, I mean, this is a real financial burden. When it comes to the financial pledge, I know that especially also the um, Federal Minister of Finance was blocking this for some time. I've heard from the European Union that was settled right now. I hope that the compromise will fly and that we can come up with a solution. We know that five billions are 
being needed for Ukraine every month, and I know that we have to carry our share. Um, that was not, was not easy. Last thing, EU integration. There was a window of opportunity, but also, and that's what I would like to say here, we should not forget about Georgia. I mean, Georgia is kind of left out now. Nobody uh, mentioned Georgia even more, nowhere, and that is also a huge problem. We had a trio before. Uh, Georgia was the trendsetter for decades or for 12 years, but now it's almost off, off the table, and that is what at least we here shouldn't forget to mention in our member states and in our institution. We should bring Georgia back and should at least find a solution if they are not in the NEGO team and they, if they do not receive the candidate status. <coughs> Thank you, Viola. Merslav. <coughs> It's clear that um, Europe uh, and the West is lacking uh, serious leadership. Leadership that can act fast um, and decisive. And uh, we are talking about the uh, effect on voters and so on, but if we will provide Ukraine enough today, maybe you would not be, any of us would be suffering and you will be in politics and everything would be fine in European Union and in European countries. So it's very, again, the point is provide today, help today. And Ukraine is ready to, to, fight, that, to fight that war for you. Thank Please. you, Miroslav. Nicola. Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, uh, you were, Viola, we were talking about uh, Georgia. Uh, I will put the things uh, very simply. I think the fate of Georgia will be decided in Ukraine. Uh, I think that's also another reason. You have also Belarus, you have also Serbia, you have, I will come back to that, for another reason for which Ukraine must win and Russia fully, totally defeated, is that it will have tremendous far-reaching positive consequences on Georgia, on Belarus, and also on some countries, maybe Hungary, maybe Serbia, because you have uh, an African countries as well, Central Asian countries. Because if Putin is fully defeated, those countries would not bank on Russia anymore. So, I mean, we must understand this positive snowball effect. Because even for Serbia, if Russia is defeated, what could be the interest of Serbia uh, to cause up to Russia? The same for Hungary, the same for some African countries. And I think we must have the long strategic views about that. When it comes to the divide of the EU, yes, unfortunately, I think I, there is a very ominous signs also in Italy. What will I mean there will be the results of the elections in Italy, you know? Uh, because, of course, uh, Mario Draghi was a very good asset for us. He was very strong, very tough, uh, you know, on, on, on Russia. What will be the next governments with the coalitions of the right and far right? Then the third thing, which is, in my view, also very important. We are not doing enough against Russian influence. Oh, that's something that I stated probably 10 years ago already, I mean. But no, I mean, we are European countries, and I think we have to state that very clearly. We are at war with Russia. We are at war. We have to recognize. And then when you have within our own countries, some political parties, sometimes former member of the government or member of parliament, causing up to Putin, taking the order from the Kremlin. When you have those ties between foreign interference and corruption, we cannot remain not active and I'm speaking for many European countries, my country as well. I mean, if we consider that war is a serious thing, who is it possible that the TV channels are giving the floor to our enemies? Let's address that. Nicola, thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, as promised, now's the conversation. I'd like to have your comments. There must have been something that we said up here that you disagree with or something you want to comment on. Um, and I would love to have this.
Uh, let me start, not yet, Kurt, hang on, uh, pride of place, but all the way in the back. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in the blue, yes, you. In the blue, in, yeah, please. And there's, I guess there are microphones. Yep, yeah, there we are. And please just introduce yourself. And Hi, um, I'm Tamara Cergoleshvili. I'm the founder of uh, online platform, online media platform Tabula. Uh, well, thank you for extremely interesting conversation. I have a very short question. Uh, first, you mentioned that Russia must be defeated, and I cannot agree more. But what exactly does it mean for you? When are you going to say that Russia is defeated? That's first thing, and the second very short question. And before war in Ukraine, there was war in Georgia, and this panel is about Western response. And I remember 13th of August, when I had a feeling that I was born the second time, when President Bush made a statement about Russian military, the US military aircraft landing Tbilisi airport, and US warships entering the Black Sea Aquatorium. So do you think that anything from current Western response to Ukraine crisis compares to, with powerfulness to the strength of this message of President Bush? Has anything done that as strong as the statement of 13th of August? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Kurt, um, can you ask your question as well? And then we'll do both. We'll take uh, answers to both and uh, think about who wants to respond to what's victory, John. I mean, it's, it's you, but others as well. Okay. Yes, Kurt, Kurt Ter Volker, Ambassador Volker. Terrific panel, Bill. Thank you very much. Three quick things in response to your question of what do we do now. I will disagree with John Herbst on one thing. We should be making clear from the West now that any negotiations between Russia and Ukraine to end the war should be based on the premise that Russian forces leave all of Ukrainian territory, all. Second thing is, you said this, John, and I agree. We should be lifting the self-imposed limits on our provision of military assistance to Ukraine and specifically give them the longest range artillery necessary, fighter aircraft, tanks, and air defense systems to protect civilian population centers. And the third thing, which has not come up uh, enough, and I want to emphasize this as much as I can, we need to get going on rebooting the Ukrainian economy now. Ukraine's economy is down about 30% uh, because of the war. Unemployment is about 30% as well. And a lot of this is sustained artificially by government payments. We need the private sector back. And so I would propose that every EU member state, the European Union, United States, Canada, UK, we appoint a special coordinator for Ukraine reconstruction to work together with Ukraine, set priorities, and start doing things that will uh, subsidize uh, risk insurance premiums, uh, insurance for uh, private investors going into Ukraine to get the private economy fully back online again. Kurt, thank you. So, um, a couple of questions then, starting off. Uh, the first question, John, I'm going to ask you on what is victory, but others will, Viola, Nikola, Miroslav, you will have thoughts about this, John. Um, what is victory? Um, the, the other question about Georgia, uh, support for Georgia, important to r r remind us that that's on the table, and then we'll come to, then we'll come to Kurt's questions. But what is victory? Victory, hello? Victory means, am I on? Okay, victory means that Putin fails to subdue Ukraine. That means that Ukraine emerges from this conflict, an end to the fighting, as a state which has full possession of its territory, which has uh, a military which can defend itself. I would also throw in, but this is not absolutely essential, security guarantees. And it has full use of its territorial waters and is therefore economically viable. That is, that is victory for Ukraine and defeat for Russia. Or for, on, defeat on, for Putin. Good, good, good. Uh, on, that, on that first question, it was a great one. I'm glad others will have thoughts. Yes, Nick. Uh, victory means different things. First of all, I mean, Ukraine must regain fully its territorial integrity. It means Donbass and Crimea. But victory for the EU and for the world means also uh, basically integrity of Georgia. And I think Roger must recover also his integrity. Integrity for Moldova, freedom for Belarus, justice for war crimes, 
and also collective acknowledgments by the Russian peoples of the crimes committed by Stalin and Putin. Perfect. I would, just, I would just refrain that and, uh, and uh, uh, one more thing to add to it. Ukraine clear its territory and become an EU member and become a NATO member right away. Mm. Yes, Viola. Maybe on the uh, court's question regarding EU, uh, the Ukrainian eco economic situation, the reconstruction and so on, I think the EU together with uh, Canada and the US has invested into the decentralization. We have great structures uh, within the uh, Ukraine and we have a great and a very strong civil society. What would we need when we channel billions and billions of private or public money into the state. We need a good scrutiny body. We need a monitoring system which is transparent, which gives credibility also to our taxpayers that the money is allocated where it is needed and it is not misused by uh, some um, oligarchy structures in Kiev. So I think the EU has proposed um, maybe a structure of one-third, 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 one-third to the civil society, one-third to the municipal and city level, and one-third to the national, to the central level, and that needs to be oversight by the respective institutions, EU and Ukraine. I think this would be a wonderful system if the U.S. would join us. They are perfectly welcome. Viola, um, uh, uh, there's this question on Georgia. Do you want to address that? Well, I mean, I think we have all realized that it was a huge mistake not to act more decisively and not to put in sanctions at the 13th of August. And we are regretful now see if we had done at that time in 2008, maybe we could have prevented that war and maybe we could have even prevented the annexation of Crimea. But now it's too late and it's good to maybe make sure that as you have described or you have given the definition for the defeat now where we are. And in the best case, yes, we could put this on the um, negotiation agenda that Georgia is uh, it's part of this basket. I doubt this is realistic, but at least we could ask for that. Yes. Uh, one last aspect, John, this is, this is for you. Um, Kurt raised this question about, which you also addressed, negotiations. And Kurt says, only um, when all Russian troops are out. Um, your thoughts? Uh, I, I find it very hard to imagine that Russian troops would leave Crimea um, even if they were willing to leave the rest of Ukraine. I imagine that in the best scenario, uh, we will have a negotiation which leads to, which is not dependent upon the Russian withdrawal, but recognition by Russia that this is on the table, and at the end of which Russia would withdraw from all of continental Ukraine. And we may well find ourselves in a situation where the international community in Russia agrees to disagree on Crimea. Uh, the only way we might be able to achieve, in my opinion, what Kurt lays out, is if, as a result of a serious Russian defeat on the battlefield, there's a change of regime in Moscow, which is willing to consider everything, including the withdrawal from Crimea. And I don't think that's a crazy possibility, but I also don't think that's a likelihood. Thank you, John. Uh, okay, next questions. Um, all the way in the back. Uh, yes, sir. The, yes. Short. <laughs> there you go. Introduce yourself. My name is Michael Washura. I'm with Newsweek. Newsweek. So concretely, yesterday, Dmitry Peskov said that Russia is prepared for the EU, the United States, NATO, to accept Russia's conditions. Right. This was not an indication that they are ready to negotiate. In fact, <laughs> the Kremlin leadership has demonstrated again and again that it is prepared to continue this war until it collapses. Given that reality, what are Western countries doing in order to be prepared to continue supplying Ukraine with all of the weaponry it needs? Industrial production, incentives for further production of missiles, tanks, armored vehicles. What are Western countries doing in order to be prepared to continue supplying Ukraine 
potentially for years to come. Exactly the topic of this question and uh, of this of this panel. Um, John's ready to. But let's get one other question, John, and then we. Uh, yes, sir. Right in the also in the back in the sunglasses. Yes, introduce. Hello, I'm Georgi Aniani from Transparency International Georgia. Uh, a very brief question. Uh, wonderful panel, wonderful ideas. Uh, uh, none of you mentioned, though, uh, the Russian people as an agent of change. So none of you think that Russian people can really, I don't know, push something or change something inside Russia? And respectively, do you think that some measures can be taken to kind of push Russians to, 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 to that direction? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, on the first question, um, uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, what are we doing now? Um, and both uh, in the United States and in Europe. Uh, that's, again, the topic of this, quest of this whole panel. John. Okay. One of the advantages that at least the American military has taken from Moscow's big invasion of Ukraine is they've seen what a future great power war might look like. And they've realized the value of certain types of weapons. We've all heard about HIMARS now for the first time in our lives. Not you, Ben. Uh, and in fact, one of the, one, I'd say one of the half steps the Biden administration has taken, uh, the Pentagon invited our arms producers to a meeting like three months ago to talk about ramping up production lines. And I know there are some decisions that have been made to do this, which is a good thing. But I've also heard that they've not been ramped up very much, which is not a good thing, not just in the current context of preparing ourselves for the future, but also having enough stuff to give to Ukraine in the immediate term and the short term. And that has to change. Thanks, John. Yes, Miroslav. Um, uh, you ask a very, very important question about uh, military production. And I think um, in addition to providing uh, military assistance to Ukraine, uh, West and United States should actually use Ukrainian ability to produce and as uh, Kurt mentioned, first of all, support today's existing businesses right now, maybe create some kind of insurance fund uh, on the level of, I don't know, NATO European Union to support businesses who are working right now and then uh, ask the Western producers of weapons to come to Ukraine and invest in Ukraine and do it because we can, prov I mean, you can provide as much as you can. However, Ukraine has to sustain and build their own military as well to actually um, uh, be stronger on, uh, on that stage for later on. Uh, second, uh, the question on, um, on Russian people. Unfortunately, at this point, majority biggest majority of Russian people are supporting the war in Ukraine. And we don't see it changing. We see uh, some voices, marginal voices, who are speaking out against the war. However, every time they do that in Russia, Belarus, they are imprisoned, threatened, and they are uh, getting silenced. So I think uh, nothing can change in the Russian society un until they really will feel personal suffering from what is going on in Ukraine. They are brainwashed. They don't understand what's going on in Ukraine. They still believe their government uh, because 20 years old um, a machine of, uh, uh, of brainwashing worked and worked not only in Russia, worked in, 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 in European Union as well. So I think the idea of visa ban that was introduced by a couple of Baltic states, uh, I think it's a good idea because we saw right away how Russians reacted and were very angry about this, uh, this possible move. We need to make, make them feel and understand the, the suffering that Ukrainians are, um, are feeling right now. And that's the only way to change their calculation and, and thoughts. Thank you, Miroslava. So, um, Viola and, and then uh, Nicola, and then we'll have one more question. But, uh, Just 
very, very quickly, I mean, you have uh, asked, have we given up on the Russian people? No, of course not. I wish we could have done more. But for example, in your lovely country, I think have ended up now 45,000 Russian uh, um, citizens. And you can do a lot, I mean, to really create a more critical uh, bunch of people who get ready for a defeat of Russia. I don't know what the Ge uh, Georgian government actually does, whether they have an overview, what kind of political mindset they have, what they are ready for, how to prepare those people here, what kind of opposition this might be. I mean, I know that we in the European Union support this critical independent civil society, but it is increasingly difficult to channel money, to address them, to target them and so on. But, of course, I mean, if you read the surveys of Lev Gutkov, um, I, you, you become very, let's say, uh, depressed. I mean, the majority seems to believe this 20-year-old uh, long-lasting propaganda, and it will take some time to shift this uh, majority opinion into, a, let's say, a post-Putin or post-imperialism. This will be not uh, done by tomorrow. Viola, thank you. Nicola. Well, two, two, three things. First of all, I think what we have to, to do is, of course, to support, I mean, and to speak about the Russian dissidents, about uh, my friend, Vladimir Kramotsa, who is in prison, uh, Ilya Yashin, uh, Alexei Navalny, and many others. And I think we have to speak loud and clear. Let not them fall into the holes of oblivion. I think that's the first thing. The second thing is as we have to perceive, as uh, Viola rightly said, it will take time. As it will be the kind of process that uh, Germany experimented, and uh, probably it should be even more successful, but it took years before, I mean, the, the speech of Richard von uh, Weizsäcker, on, uh, yes, uh, 40 years, on, on, uh, on the 8th of May uh, 1985, 40 years after the end of the war. But that's exactly the same kind of process. I won't, of course, discuss long and would elaborate about the questions of personal guilt or collective guilt. I mean, that's a very complicated issue. But if there is no sympathy with the sufferings of the Ukrainians, if each Russian person uh, do not, doesn't feel guilty doesn't feel guilty, yes, for the crimes committed in his or her name. Nothing will happen. And the last thing is that, I mean, we all expect Putin to fall. He must fall one way or another, and the sooner the better. But, of course, it doesn't mean that it will bring immediately a change on results. It could be, I mean, other things. But what we have to state as Western leaders, we must not fear a void in Russia. We must not fear, I mean, the collapse of the Russian Empire. We must go in this direction, push in these directions. Then everything could happen. But when I hear people saying, okay, it could be worse than Putin. Okay, it could be worse than Hitler. As well as than Stalin. No, I mean, no, we have put it, and he must be radically defeated. Thank you. Sir, right here. Last, this will be the last question for this panel, and uh, there's a microphone coming to you here. Much, Bill Taylor. Uh, I am Sergeant of of Ukraine in Georgia, Andrei Kasyanov. Today, uh, the Minister of Infrastructure talked about safety and security in terms of the grain transportation. But today, we didn't raise the very important question regarding the unblocking of the Black Sea, regarding the unblocking of the economic development of the countries. And my question is pretty much straightforward. What is the Western response to the deblocking of the Black Sea? Is that there is any tangible strategy of NATO in place for unblocking in the shortest in the shortest terms? Thank you so much. But it, I mean, maybe one of the security experts knows more. But for me, what I've heard is it's Turkey who uh, refers to the Montreux Convention. They are very strict. 
and they are not allowing anyone to enter the Black Sea. They are controlling the street. The, uh, yeah, uh, and so there's nothing you can do. They are not allowing any other uh, ship apart from the Ukrainian um, logistics or Russian logistics uh, to enter. This highly, I think, um, controlled by, by the Turkish authorities, as far as I know. Uh, it's, it's true that Turkey has the right under the Montreux Convention to control the straits. It's also true that an energetic and a persuasive Washington can also affect attitudes. Uh, so this is something where more can be done. Um, we have not seen a willingness to use um, our leverage there. Uh, I agree with you, this is something we should look at. Bill, uh, yes, Ed, I, I last, think, last, last comment. I, I think part of the issue is, is recognizing the, the, how critical this issue is to Ukrainian survival. And, and, you know, Turkey is playing a very, very complicated game that, you know, I, I don't know when Erdogan wake up which side of the bed he, he gets off. But, but there's precedent on uh, escorting uh, um, uh, cargo ships. The, the latest example being the, during the Iran-Iraq war when British and American Navy escorted tankers through the Persian Gulf because it was critical to the global economy. And, and I would say that it, in this case, unblocking the Black Sea ports of Ukraine is also critical and more should be done. And, and as John said, more pressure could be put on. That's the message from this panel. More should be done. Uh, Nikola, Edward, uh, Mirslav, uh, Viola, John, thank you all very much. Please join me in thanking this panel. <clears throat> David, back to you. And please also thank Bill Taylor for a great job of moderating. Panel, fantastic start to our, our conference here.